to this Arise two-part interview special. I'm Judita De Silva. Now, Western doctors have nicknamed it the African woman's torment because it occurs more often in African women than in any other female demographic. Fibroids have such a frequency that many women fear it as almost an inevitability. But today we're going to try to debunk the myths and answer the concerns with the help of my guest. She's the medical director of Health Corps Limited Nigeria and medical director of the NGO, the Health Zone Wellness Initiative. It's Dr. Toju Chike Obi. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Judith. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, this is one, this is something that it's, it's quite close to my heart because I've had lots of family members go through yeah. this. So I want to go try to cover as much as possible. Yes. Now, first of all, can you define what a fibroid is? Yes. So a fibroid is a tumor, and a tumor is just a collection of cells. Yeah. That's really all a tumor is. The difference between this kind of tumor and a cancerous tumor is that this a fibroid is benign. It, it's not cancer. So it's a tumor, but it's not cancer. Basically what it is is that maybe one of the cells in your uterus has gone crazy and doesn't know how to shut itself up. So it just keeps growing and growing and growing until it becomes this dense, almost tennis ball dense type yeah. thing in your uterus. Um, a good friend of mine who's an obstetrician said, you know, she gave this analogy. It's the best way to describe it. If you think of an avocado pear, yeah. and an avocado pear has the fleshy part, which we all love to eat. Yeah. Then it has the pit, the round stone in the middle. If you take that stone out, there's a cavity there. Yeah. Imagine that that's the uterus, that the avocado pear is actually in the shape of the uterus, and the space where the stone was yeah. is the inside of the, that's your womb in essence. Yeah. So a fibroid can be in the fleshy part that you eat, yeah. and if you run your hand around the inside, you don't feel it. If you run your hand around the outside of your uterus, you don't feel it at all because it's in the fleshy part. Okay. However, a fibroid can also be in the outer part of the fleshy part. So if you run your hand over the, the, around the uterus, you can feel that lump because it's towards the outside. of. So it's like if you took that avocado pear and there's an extra lump on the outside yeah. of it. Okay. Or the tumor can be in the fleshy part but shooting up, bulging out into the space where the stone would be okay. inside your womb. So that's another kind of fibroid. So when it bulges out into the inside of the womb, it's called a submucosal fibroid. Okay. If it's bulging out on the outside, it's subserosal, you know, and yeah. so, so that's the only, but they're all the same fibroids. It's just location. See, now one thing about fibroids, they say, or with any ailment, is early detection. Yes. And one thing that I, I did notice is the protruding stomach tend, yes. tended to be a trend with mm -hmm. African women. Could you t um, explain why it is, first of all, that it's such a common thing in African women? Mm -hmm. And then based on the description you just gave, how you do get that protruding stomach as okay. a symptom? Okay. Um, there's been a lot of research around why Africans and African Americans have a higher incidence. They're two to three times more likely than any other races to have a fibroid. Yeah. So a lot, the, the only research that's looking like it might be making sense is around the area of vitamin D. Okay. So low vitamin D levels actually high risk for getting fibroids. And African women in general have lower vitamin D levels. And so there's, it's thought to be that there's a link. It's not causal yet. You know, we can't say it's because African women have low vitamin D levels. That's why they tend to get more fibroids. But there appears to be a connection between low vitamin D levels and the development of fibroid tumors. Well, you see, that confuses me because I associate vitamin D with the sun, and okay. Africans are in sun-laden countries. Exactly, but our pigment on our skin actually makes it harder for us to convert, use the sun's rays to convert the, the uh, vitamin D3 okay. in our skin into actual vitamin D. Oh, I see. Okay. So it's a, it's, it's a misconception that because that's why we need a lot of sun, because we need tons of sun to make the same amount of vitamin D as a Caucasian person needs 
can make with less sun. Okay. You know, so we tend to trend lower in our vitamin D levels. As far as like actual fibroids, for if let's say you've gone for a scan and you get that letter back mm -hmm. from the doctor, yes. if you see the word fibroadenoma or teratoma or yes. cyst, okay. which are the ones to be terrified okay, by? Out, yeah. Okay. Well, a teratoma is a tumor that is not a fibroid. It's very different from a fibroid, and it could have cancerous parts, okay. all right? A cyst is something totally different. It tends to occur on your ovaries. Most cysts, cysts are functional. They're as a result of your menstrual cycle. So they're very, very different from fibroids. If you get the diagnosis fibroids or leomyoma, that's the technical medical term for fibroids. If you have more than one, they'll say leomyomata. That's all plain old garden variety fibroids, and it's nothing to be worried about. It's not cancerous. Always benign. Okay. Always benign. But to go back to your question about the, the yeah. abdomen, most fibroids are incidental findings, which means it's usually in the course of some other investigation. Maybe you go to your doctor for your annual gynecological checkup and she's doing the bimanual palpation and feeling your uterus. And she also this looks, feels a little bumpy here. It looks like you might have a fibroid. Then she recommends a scan, a sonogram, and it does show that you have the fibroids. You have to have significant, either significant numbers of fibroids or significantly large fibroids for you to begin to have that protrusion of your belly because your uterus is a pelvic organ. It sits low below in your pelvis. Yeah. It's when it's so big that it's risen out of the pelvis almost like a pregnant uterus does that it begins to then be like a pregnant uterus, yeah. begins to push all your other abdominal organs up and then you begin to have the protuberant belly. So you have to have a significant amount of fibroids or a significantly large fibroid to begin to have that. But when, one thing I wanted to ask is about the actual causes. Okay. Because when you know the causes, you can then start thinking about prevention or okay. self-diagnosis yes. or early detection. Yes. So what causes a fibroid? fibroid? Okay. We do not know what causes a fibroid, okay. but we do know what places women at risk for fibroids. Okay. And to go back to something I've said before, obesity places you at risk for fibroids. Strangely enough, excessive alcohol use places you at risk for fibroids. Having an early age at menarche, meaning you were very young when you started your menstrual cycle, places you at risk you know, for fibroids. Um, and then of course there are some, um, um, you know, conditions that, you know, just like environmental, you know, toxins that, you know, yeah. nobody knows what they are that we feel, okay, maybe these are some of the things that trigger fibroids, but for the most part early, have starting your periods early, alcohol and obesity have strong links mm -hmm. to fib development of fibroids. So in terms of prevention, don't drink a lot. Yeah. You can't do anything about how old you are when you started your menstrual yeah. cycle. So that's not within your, you know, your area. You know, it's not a modifiable risk factor. It's not something you can change. But being overweight is something you can change. And being physically active is something you can change because also that has links to developing fibroids. The point you said that about um, when you discover fibroids, it tend to be incidental findings. Yes, yes. Um, I read that. Fibroids tend to affect a number of things. They can affect your menstrual cycle. They affect pre um, pregnancies. Yes. They yes. affect menopause. Yes. Yes. So what kind of red flags should you see in your pregnancy okay. or your menstruation to say okay. this might be this a fibroid? So these are, the, these are the things that you look out for that are a clue that you have fibroids. The first thing is excessive bleeding during your menstrual cycle. Excessive bleeding and prolonged bleeding. When you're bleeding to the point when you're having clots come out, you have to think, hmm, I may have fibroids, okay? So that's one. The other thing is if you're having a sense of pressure and pain, pelvic pressure and pain, yeah. it should make you think, hmm, maybe I have fibroids. If you find that you are 
having frequent urination like a woman does in the first the reason a woman pees a lot in the first trimester is because the uterus suddenly is enlarging and pushing on the bladder okay. and so you feel like going to pee all the time because there's pressure on the bladder yeah. so the fibroid does the same thing because the presence of the fibroid in your uterus makes your uterus larger and so it can begin to push on your on your bladder so if you find that you're going to fear having frequent urination that's another clue another thing is sudden constipation you've never been somebody who's been constipated and suddenly you start being constipated if a fibroid is large enough and it's compressing your large intestinal tract yeah it could cause constipation so those are things you can watch out for and of course if you your periods are so heavy you're starting to feel lightheaded and weak and you go to your doctor and the doctor says you're anemic that's it, something else that needs to cause you to go and check to see if you have fibroids the, when i say most fibroids i found as incidental is that a lot of people 70 to 80 percent of women will have fibroids by age by the time they hit menopause yeah but most of us don't have fibroids that make a difference one way or another you know they're there but you know like you remember how i described depending yeah. on what part they are so it's when you start to have any of those symptoms or you have frequent miscarriages when you have frequent miscarriages that's one of the things that's going to be investigated to see if there's a reason because sometimes if you have because there's a there's there's a myth that if you have fibroids it means you can't get pregnant yeah. and you can't carry a baby to term absolutely not it's only if that fibroid is so large and it's inside the cavity of your uterus where it's going to like you know squeeze a, a baby that's trying to grow there yeah. that's the only time it would impact and even lots of women still get pregnant and carry babies to term you know but when you have a history of frequent miscarriages that's another reason to investigate to see if you have fibroids so can fibroids affect the ability to conceive or is it more interfering with the pregnancy once conception hasn't has occurred they it tends to interfere with the pregnancy okay. once conception has occurred because if everything is fine if your fallopian tubes are fine you're ovulating well you're making good eggs you're having regular sexual intercourse and if there's nowhere for that fertilized egg to implant inside your womb because there's this big fibroid in there then yes it could but little fibroids people have kids all the time with little fibroids in place and it doesn't it doesn't affect anything and could, could I ask it does age affect let's say you've, you've formed a fibroid because I know of young ladies in their 20s who've yes, had them yes, and in their 40s yes, 50s yes. but if you're older does it affect you because I remember um, a friend of mine her aunt developed one and she said she was constantly exhausted mm -hmm. and it was the exhaustion she went to the GP to treat and then they found out she, she had, had a fibroid, fibroid. Um, fibroids can begin from about the age of 16 and they can begin at any point in it it's a problem of reproduction so it's people of re, women of reproduction tip age who develop fibroids so technically by age 16 you could have a fibroid now if you have a fibroid in your 20s and it's growing and growing, and fibroids strangely act they they have different ways of acting that's the other thing that sets apart the kind of fibroids african women have we tend to have larger fibroids yeah. and more tumors. So one person, I have personally assisted in a surgery where when we took the woman's uterus out, there had to be more than 20 fibroids in there. You couldn't even see the normal morphology of the uterus anymore. And this thing was, I'm not kidding, it was about a full-term pregnancy, the size of a full-term pregnancy womb. And it was all layer myomata it was all fibroids you know so we tend to have these big tumors we have multiple tumors you know and but it can happen at any age the good news though is that when you hit menopause yeah. the hormones estrogen and progesterone that support the growth of fibroids diminish okay. as a condition of menopause and so fibroids then tend to shrink okay after menopause and definitely if they don't shrink they don't grow any further so wherever they they tend to shrink after menopause there's a variety but you were telling me that it just depends on placement because could you explain that because I'm terrified of all of them okay so there's the remember I said your uterus is like an avocado pear yeah. 
So if you take the stone in the middle of the seed, the stone in the middle of the avocado pear, that space you have in the middle, that's your womb, okay? okay? The fleshy part of the avocado that we eat, that's the muscle of the uterus. Okay, that's all muscle, because the uterus is a muscle. And so that inside cavity where the stone was, that's where, if you have a baby, that's where the baby grows, where that stone is, all right? If a fibroid is in the muscle of your uterus and is popping out into the space where a baby would grow, that's really the only fibroid that has the potential to affect your fertility meaning it has the potential, and it's only a potential, it's not a given that it's gonna stop you from getting pregnant or stop you carrying a baby to full term. If the fibroid is in the fleshy part of the uterus, again, it really has minimal impact unless you have several of them that have distorted the shape of the uterus. If you have one that's sitting on the surface of the uterus towards the outside, again, that has minimal impact on your fertility. The main fear people have with fibroids, African women have with fibroids, is that it's going to mean I can't have kids. Yeah. Or it's going to mean I can't carry a baby to term. And then, of course, all the myths and things about bleeding and, oh, the only way to treat it is to take your uterus out. And that is absolutely not true. We have really great ways to treat fibroids and preserve a woman's chance of fertility. Now, this, um, this is actually a case I know, I know from a family member. What was the, what's the difference between an ablation mm -hmm. and a hysterectomy? Okay. Because I know that um, she was recommended an ablation because she wanted to preserve the uterus. Yes. Because that's, yes. as you said, it's such a thing that women are precious about because it's, it's almost important. defining of their physicality. Exactly. exactly. So, all right. So... There are different ways to treat a fibroid. You have the, med you could treat it with medication. So you can give somebody hormones that block the progesterone and the estrogen that the fibroid feeds off, because yeah. those hormones make them grow bigger. So if you, can, if you give something that blocks the ability of the body to produce to, to produce the progesterone, or rather, the ability of the uterus to respond to progesterone and estrogen, you can so help. You, you yeah, Yes, you, you stunt its growth, okay? Sometimes you can give treatments that, you know, minimize the blood flow so you don't, you don't have heavy, as heavy periods as, you know. So those are things that you do if the concern is not about having kids or you, you, the concern is the bleeding, yeah. is the debilitation. Like you said, the one who was so weak. The weakness comes from anemia. You've lost so much, you lose blood, so much blood every month yeah. that you become anemic and then you become easily fatigued and you're weak. So that's one way to treat fibroids, okay? Now, another way to treat fibroids is the totally non-invasive way, which means there's no surgery involved, but it's not medication. The simplest is what we call a focus ultrasound, really surgery, but it's non-surgery. And you go like you're in an MRI machine, and they actually focus an ultrasound wave directly, guided by the MRI imaging, directly on your fibroid, and direct a very focused ultrasonic energy wave at that fibroid. And what it does is it causes the fibroid to die and disintegrate. So that's one way. Then another thing you can do is the blood vessel that supplies the fibroid, you can do what's called a uterine artery embolization. Yeah, so if this, is the fi if this is the fibroid, yeah. remember it's a tumor, so it needs a blood vessel, an artery that's, you know, to help it to grow. What you do is you introduce little particles into that artery that then block the exit into the fibroid. So in essence, you starve the fibroid, you cut off its blood supply, and then it dies, okay? What you talked about, the ablation, yeah. is a way where, is, is a minimally invasive form of treatment, which means there's some, a few cuts made into it. So what they do with ablation is they go into the uterus and they use high heat, 
either extremely, which it's either in the form of electrical energy or hot water energy. Yeah. And in, in essence, what is done is they burn off the lining of your uterus. Okay. Remember I said some of the fib fibroids can be in that inner part yeah. where the womb. So what they do is they burn off that whole lining because it's full of blood vessels, very rich matrix for the fibroid to survive on. So they burn all of that off. The problem with that is it preserves your uterus. You continue to keep your uterus, but it's unlikely you'll be able to conceive yeah. because it's burned off all of that. So the only difference between an ablation and a hysterectomy is that an ablation preserves the uterus. So you can tell yourself, I still have a yeah. uterus, yeah. but that uterus cannot, you, you're not going to be able to have a baby with that uterus. And usually ablation and hysterectomy are options for menopausal and postmenopausal women, a woman who's still in her childbearing age, who's interested very much in still having children, an ablation or a hysterectomy is not what's advised. What's advised for that demographic, the woman who has fibroids, who wants to conceive, is myomectomy. Okay, which is removing the fibroids. And there are ways you can remove the fibroids. You can do what's called a myolysis. Again, they focus laser or ultrasonic waves at the fibroid and it disintegrates. Okay. Or they freeze, they focus really cold um, material like nitrogen liquid into the fibroid and it freezes the fibroid and crumbles in and, and it dies, okay? Or you do laparoscopically little incisions on the abdomen and use robotics and go in and cut out the fibroids. And all of this, what it does is it preserves the uterus. And it's, it's what is recommended for women who still want to have children. But could there ever be a case where a woman of prime childbearing age has such a fibroid that a hysterectomy is the only option. Could, is there a fibroid location Absolutely. like that where they, that's the treatment? Absolutely. Or Sometimes there's no choice, you know, because there's so many fibroids. How many of them are you going to re remove? So in those sort of scenarios, what a very good obstetrician will do is they will try and get rid of the ones that are in the cavity, that impinge on the cavity, and not worry too much about the ones that are in the muscle of the uterus, in the hopes that removing the leumata that's in, you know, in the womb space itself yeah. would be enough and, and still, you know, give the woman a chance to have children. So just so, for me, just for understanding, when you um, discussed about when a mother is pregnant mm -hmm. or an expectant mother is pregnant yes. and there's a fibroid. You said that the um, fibroids are fed by a blood vessel. Yes. Your fetus is fed by blood vessels. Yes. Yes. So how can you starve one but not the other? It's funny. Women with small fibroids go ahead and have, honestly, they have kids. But once in a while, it does happen where when a woman is pregnant and she has a fibroid, some crazy stuff goes on with that fibroid where it begins to be extremely painful for her. Yeah. And so they have no choice but to figure out a way to either do some sort of you know, embolization for the artery to that fibroid to get rid of it or to, you don't want to do anything in the pregnancy. So it oftentimes is something that she has to sort of bear it because it's not life-threatening, but yeah. it can be extremely painful when a fibroid that's coexisting with a pregnancy undergoes that process. Okay. Yeah, but they can coexist. Okay. Because remember I said, for a, a baby is nourished by the placenta, all right? Where there's a problem is if there's so many um, um, fibroids in the inside of the womb, you know, the placenta has to spread over a certain area of the inside of the womb and then supply the child. So then it can impact, you know, where that placenta, you know, how the placenta grows. And in fact, placental detachment can be one of the risks okay. that you can have if you have fibroids and you're pregnant. So Circling back to when we were discussing the types of fibroids, when there's submucosal, subserosal, yes. Which are the ones that cause pain? What location are they in the uterus? Are you say that's why you're causing okay. pain? Because one thing that worries a lot of women is, I don't, I don't know what's going on. Yes, okay. 
there are two types that cause pain usually. There's one that is, it's called a pedunculated. It's almost like it's on a stalk, okay. hanging into the inside of the womb, but sort of on a stalk. So if that stalk twists or anything, if there's torsion, then there can be tremendous amount of pain. Usually the pain from fibroids is from the pressure. It's not the fibroid itself that's hurting. It's because your uterus has grown and expanded and it's pushing on other vital organs in your pelvis, such as your bladder, such as your um, ovaries, such as your um, in, in large intestinal tract. That's where the discomfort comes from. So do you always have to treat a fibroid? Like you've given us the, no. the very treatment. No. Sometimes you can just leave them. No, There's, you can do the, the wait and see approach because most fibroids cause no problems. I had a fibroid. I have no idea when the fibroid first <laughs> popped up, but I know at some point in my mid-30s, and I went for my annual check about, so, oh, you have a fibroid. And I was like, really? <laughs> and it was yeah. there. Okay. After a while, I started to have excessive bleeding during, you know, during the menstrual cycle, and so I opted to do something about the bleeding because the bleeding was my concern. And their IUDs, that have progestin hormone in them, which, pre, which cause the lining of the, of the uterus not to be as, you know, hyperemic, not to be as well nourished by blood, yeah. you know. And so that kind of an IUD actually minimizes and lessens the bleeding from fibroids. So I had no interest in removing my fibroid because it wasn't bothering me. All it was doing was giving me heavy periods. As soon as I took care of the heavy periods part of it, I was fine. You, you know what I mean? So most fibroids, a sensible obstetrician gynecologist, unless there's a problem, like I said, with having children yeah. or with a severe anemia or something like that from blood loss is a wait and it's a wait and watch. If you have no symptoms, why do anything about it? Thank you so much. It's been really, really informative talking to you. Thank you for coming in. The pleasure has been great being here with you. Well, that's all from this Arise interview special with Dr. Toju Chikeobi. Be sure to catch the second part of this two part interview where we spoke about fertility and the physical and psychological effects it has on African women. I'm Judith De Silva, and thank you for watching.